loud. All right, we are recording. Great. So let's get started. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming to our Planning with a Purpose program today. Um, happy Earth Day, which I believe is tomorrow. We're doing it a little day early. I am um, Jan Beglinger. I'm the Master Gardener Coordinator here in Genesee County, um, New York, in case you're watching us from somewhere else. Today, we're going to talk about native plants, using native plants in the garden. Um, so planting with a purpose. So one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of years is how native plants are now kind of the buzzword in horticulture, garden blogs, even garden magazines. And they're even being touted on social media. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of popular now, <laughs> which is a good thing. And, but after talking with some gardeners who have been gardening for a while, and they're interested in using native plants, but maybe they're not really sure how to introduce them into gardens that they already have established. So what I want to do today is talk about what native plants are, why they're important, and then give you some tips that I've read about, done myself, or learned along the way as far as um, the incorporating native plants into your garden. So for those on Zoom, if you have questions, please put it in the chat. We'll get to them um, at the end of the program and we'll move along here. And there we go. So I picked a couple definitions of what native plants were off the internet because everybody has a little bit of a different idea. Um, these are just three that I found, but when I think native plants, I generally think of plants that are been growing in an area, let's say after the last ice age, up until we had um, European settlers coming into the United States. So anything that was here prior to um, colonists bringing their own plants over from Europe, those are plants that I think have grown and evolved in this area. Um, so without human intervention, essentially, these are the straight species of native plants. Um, also, the um, native plants in our areas have also evolved with our um, native wildlife, such as insects or butterflies or birds. So there's that coevolution, there's that dependency on each other. And that's what we're actually one of the reasons we're here today is to talk about that. So why native plants? Why should we grow them? Well, they're basically that base of the food, um, food pyramid or food um, web for all of our wildlife. They're a source of food for our native bees, butterflies, insects, caterpillars, birds. So whether they need pollen and nectar or they actually need leaves to chew on or maybe birds will take seeds or sometimes nectar. You know, those native plants are there as the base. Um, and then if they don't feed on plants, they probably feed on something that fed on plants. So that's why they're the base for our food webs. Uh, let's see. So I found this interesting um, diagram. It's very visual and I like visual. Why native plants support more species um, with native of native wildlife than non-native plants. This was out of UMass. And the information that went with it was that there's a 50% higher abundance of native birds when you use native plants in your landscape, nine times higher abundance of rare birds, uh, three times more butterfly species, and two times higher abundance of native bees just from using native plants. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And we hear about all these unique relationships with native fauna, and most of us think of monarch butterflies and milkweed. But there's a lot of other ones that we don't hear about. So I picked one. His pussy toes are the host plant for caterpillars of the American painted lady. And here you can see the caterpillar down um, on my screen, it's the left hand side. Is it still the left hand side for you guys? Okay. <laughs> and then the pussy toes themselves, they're a nice little ground cover. They like dry, sunny conditions and they have a little flower, but the caterpillar will eat the leaves and develop into the American Painted Lady. 
And then this is Golden Alexander's, which I've had in my garden for a couple of years now. I took these photos last year because I was just kind of fascinated by the number of just different insects that came to this Golden Alexander. Now, the great thing about it is that it starts blooming normally the end of April, but it blooms into early June. And I had everything from that slender waist wafts there to up above the caterpillar is a ladybug nymph, green lacewing, um, an unidentified little bee. Plus, um, golden alexanders will also host some of the swallowtail butterflies because it's in the carrot family. So here we got one, two, three, four, five different insects on this slide. And I'm sure there were tons of others that came for the flowers as well as the foliage. So not all native plants are created equally. Some plants support many times more insects than other natives. And putting just one of those plants in your garden or landscape can support hundreds of species, especially of moth and um, butterfly, especially the caterpillars. And of course, trees, because of their biomass, can support way more insects than herbaceous plants. So um, Doug Tallamy, who you may be familiar with, he's an entomologist out of the University of Delaware. He and his research assistant, Kimberly Shropshire, um, put together this database. It's got like 3,200 references of what trees and plants have been found with what native plants. So National Wildlife Federation put it out as a website and it's called Native Plant Finder. So you can Google that. It's very simple to use. You put your zip code in and then it spits out witty plants and herbaceous plants. So I did it for the Batavia, New York zip code and I got the top 10 witty plants and it shows the number of Lepidoptera that use these plants. On the other side are herbaceous plants. So if we look at the woody plants, oak is number one. <clears throat> you have the potential for 521 different moths or butterflies um, using oak as um, food for them to mature. And then wild cherry and willow are next. So oak is one of the keystone plants across the United States. Almost every county in the United States has oak coming up as number one. So if you only have room for one plant, pick some type of oak tree. Um, there's all different oak species for different sites, different sizes, so look at oak. Now on the herbaceous plant site, which maybe we're more interested in is the gardening, goldenrod, sunflower, and aster are usually the top three um, keystone species. I don't know why it didn't show up for Genesee County. I have asters growing <laughs> in my garden and in the wild, but this just gives you kind of somewhere to start if you use this native plant finder. So as gardeners, you know, you already have an established garden and you want to add native plants, but what are your goals for the garden? Because this will help us create a plan for um, the plants to add. Do you want to support native bees? Do you want to support monarchs and other butterflies? Are you a bird watcher? Um, do you want more beneficial insects to help you with your pest issues? Do you like to watch fireflies during the summer? Do you also still wanna have a beautiful yard? So you can kind of answer yes to all those things. Native plants will do this. And some native plants of course overlap, but by planting butterfly larval host plants, you should see more butterflies. Of course we want milkweed for monarchs. Um, some native bees actually are specialists. So there are only certain plants that they will use for their life cycle. So. Lots of times what people will say is plant for the specialists and the generalists still get fed. So that's one thing you can look at when you're talking native bees. But there are plenty of resources and lists out there now to help you based on um, what animals you want to attract to your yard. <clears throat> so I threw this picture in here because this is kind of our typical American resident front lawn foundation plantings. Lots of times those foundation plantings are non-natives. Um, this is kind of a mix. I see the dwarf Alberta spruce, technically native, probably not great for Western New York, but this is pretty typical. So by simply switching some of these foundation plants over to native shrubs, we can actually make a pretty big impact on our native insect and bird populations. So we could do something like this yard that I was visiting in the Rochester area. 
um, this homeowner has used almost uh, not quite all native plants, but a high percentage of native plants in her landscape. So wouldn't it be nice if we could have this instead of this? <laughs> and this is a lot of work, but you can just substitute out native shrubs for this site and still um, make a difference. All right, so incorporating native plants into an existing garden or landscape. Let's kind of look at some of the things we can do. I know there's some maybe perceptions or maybe some misconceptions about using native plants. So with gardeners, I was, what's the look you're going for? Do you have a formal garden? Do you not, do you have a more informal garden? Do you like cottage gardens? Um, cottage gardens and informal gardens work very well with native plants just because of the colors and diversity. You can still have a formal garden though. You can use more compact plants to make your yard look neater. You can um, space things so you don't have more of a, a tangled look. But we also wanna think about our front yards in general. If you live in a suburban area or urban area, what are your neighborhood norms? Um, I guess you don't wanna scare your neighbors when you start saying you're gonna plant native plants maybe. If you're, um, <clears throat> considering your neighbors, um, but it's also a good, good way to educate them as to what's going on. Or you can start sneaking native plants in and you know just talk about them with your neighbors. So you want to um, basically get that idea in your mind of what, what's your look you're going for and that will also help you choose which native plants. So a lot of people will think that they have to give up their favorite garden plants in order to have um, a native pollinator garden. You, you do not, you can actually have a mix. Now the best number or the only number I was able to find um, was the US Natural Resources Conservation Services. They advised at least 75% native plants. And I'm thinking this was specifically herbaceous. So there are some other um, numbers for trees, but we're talking gardens right now. So let's talk herbaceous. You still want to plant a diversity of native plants with your non-native. So you can see the lily syrup mixed in with the bee balm and the monarch is at the bee balm. Um, and I think some of what we have to do is change our perception of that typical home landscape. Uh, we have gardens because they're beautiful and they're pretty, but maybe we need to also start thinking that those gardens should be more than that. They need to support birds, butterflies, pollinators and beneficial insects. I know when I go into my garden, I now love to see who's in the garden, who's buzzing around, what interesting insects can I find? I even start a little insect notebook so I can start trying to figure some of them out. And um, it just adds to the garden in, in my opinion. All right, so this is just an example of um, one of my favorite wasps that I discovered. She is the great golden digger wasp, and she is actually on blue sea holly, which is not native, but next to the blue sea holly is rattlesnake master, which is a native plant, not native to New York. It's really more of a prairie plant, but they're both in the same genus. So if you have blue sea holly in your garden, the great golden digger wasp doesn't seem to mind that you don't have rattlesnake master. She will go to the sea holly. So some of our garden plants will attract pollinators. We just don't know um, if the nectar and pollen quality is the same as a native plant, but at least there's food for them. And so I try to make note of which of my non-native garden plants the bees and the insects are using. And this is another one that the bees love, and this is Allium millennium. Now, as a general rule, they love a lot of Alliums. And I like Alley Millennium because it blooms for a long time in the summer and the, it's always loaded with bees. And if you have honeybees around, the honeybees especially love it. Honeybees aren't native, but they're, they're escaped and they're in the wild. Now the bulb alliums, I like to use them because they help me bridge um, a season in my garden, like late May into June where um, I need to get better about having other perennials or things in bloom. But right now the allium bulbs help me bridge, bridge that gap. And you may not realize it, but you probably already have a lot of native plants in your garden. 
They might be cultivars, but I just kind of did a quick list of things that I think about that are pretty typical in gardens. And these are all native plants. And some of them may be a surprise to you like Jacob's Ladder, Creeping Phlox, Obedient Plant. I didn't know some of those were native. So, um, you know, maybe do a little inventory in your own garden and see if how close you are to that 75%. A friend of mine, she's been putting in a pollinator garden and she's just been going on the regular list of, you know, what to plant. And lots of times it's herbs and other things that are not native. So she came up with that she had 41 different species and 19 of them were natives. So she was almost at 50% with just being a regular garden. So she doesn't have too far to go to get to that 75%. So some other ways you can incorporate, um, it's also remembering that not, not every native plant is a good match for every garden. Lots of times you read, oh, native plants are this, they're drought tolerant, they're great, they do this, they do that. Well, wait a minute, they're just like other plants. <laughs> they have specific site requirements. Some of them like regular moisture, some of them like dry sites, some of them prefer shade over sun. So we're still back to the, the great garden mantra of put the right plant in the right place. You wanna look at the hardiness, winter hardiness of the plant, the mature size, what are its light and water moisture, what are its light and water requirements? Uh, does it have a specific pH requirement for your soil? What type of soil does it prefer? Some will grow great in clay, some do fine in sandy soils. And then as gardeners, we also wanna look at the bloom time and the color. Yeah, that won't disappear for me on for you guys. So you're missing part of the... Yeah, sorry. Um, also, one thing we want to consider in um, gardens is to control weeds. And we are talking gardens, so, um, oh, now I've gone too far ahead. Just, I don't know why this, okay. Um, so, you know, we don't want to have a messy garden. We don't want our neighbors to perceive that all of our native plantings are going to be weedy. So we do want to control the weeds in them. And this is just a picture of um, some Virginia bluebells. So another thing we can do is add those native trees and shrubs. Um, as our ornamental plants die, think about replacing them with native species. And I've been doing this in, in my garden. So, you know, as a gardener, some plants make it, some don't. So now I'm looking at what can I fill that spot with and use a native, native species. We also wanna choose plants for um, garden performance as well as pollinator appeal when we're working with things in the garden. And just like our garden plants, many of our um, native plants will take several years to become established. Milkweed will take a couple years. It's very slow to establish in the garden, I have found. And I'm still with the native plants. It's first year they sleep, second year they creep, third year they leap. All right, and this is just an example of um, my front yard. Last, I had, I had a beautiful planting of Orient pet lilies in the back in front of that little trellis. Well, the voles came in and ate 99% of them. And I've had those bulbs there for probably 20 years, who knows? Um, so I'm like, well, I guess this is an opportunity to look for some native plants. The site's a little tough. It's, it dries out, it's sandy soil, it's a Western exposure, it gets full sun. So last fall, I ordered some native plants online that are supposed to meet this requirement, put them in the ground. And I'm hoping this year it's like, yay, they arrived, they're here. So hopefully this gave me a little head start, but take those um, negatives and turn them into positives when you can. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing this today. And I'm wondering if they're also seeing it because I'm sharing my screen. All right. Sorry, little technical. All right. So uh, lots of times 
any garden magazine or um, in native plants, they say plant and drifts because that gives you your color. Butterflies and bees don't want to go from a single flower and you know go 10 feet down the road to find another one. But if you're not sure how a plant will act in your garden, buy one, try it out, and then the next year um, plant in drifts. Okay, so that's one thing that I have found to do. And you know, here we have Phlox paniculata, which is a native plant and beautiful in the summer, great for hummingbirds, bees, bumblebees. It's just a, a great plant. So if we're um, getting rid of some of those non-native invasive species, we wanna replace them with native plants. Burning bush, which is a standard foundation planting over the years, we now have found that it's invasive. The seedlings get into woodland areas, but everybody loves that bright red fall color. And um, we can replace those with some native plants such as this chokeberry, which also has the bright red fall fall color, and there are others too. And we want to have plants based on whether they need moist or wet or dry or sandy or what the soil conditions are. So lots of times within a species, say this is milkweed, we can find those plants if we just do a little research and we can pick the correct one for our site. Oh, well, let's talk lawn. So you didn't think that lawns would be controversial in a um, garden setting, but they have become kind of controversial. Um, there are 40 million acres of lawn across the United States. And that is not just residential lawn, but parks and schools and athletic fields. So those 40 million acres also account for something like 30% of the water usage in the United States for residential usage. That's a lot of water being used on an um, area that maybe isn't really a great habitat. There aren't a lot of things, you know, turfs aren't native. There aren't a lot of native insects or animals that can use lawn. Um, but not everybody can take their lawns out. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we lawns are part of a problem because we also use a lot of fertilizers and pesticides on them. So if you can cut back on them, um, you don't have to treat for grubs every year if you don't have them. Um, that's one way to reduce your pesticide use. But I think one of the things you can do too is just start planting some native trees or things like that. Uh, the other thing with lawns is that turf is great for walking on. It can take the heavy foot traffic. So I actually use turf in my garden as the path, I mow it. But I also don't have just a turf lawn. I have what I would call a country lawn because it's full of turf grasses, but also dandelions and violets and clover. So mine is uh, more of a diversified lawn than many people like to have. So some uh, ideas which you can do to, if you want to reduce the amount of lawn you have, I think one of the best things is planting a native tree and then underplant it with native plants as a ground cover. Um, this is a good way to take up some square footage. Also, you could do a mixed hedge along your property line with a variety of native shrubs. That's a great place to also in the fall, put any leaves that you have, you can shoot them under your, your shrubs and then the you don't you lose your beneficial insects. You can convert a section to a pollinator or butterfly garden with native plants. Um, if you have a large lawn, like a couple acres, some people just insist on mowing all that, just consider leaving the farther areas unmown and leave it natural and see what happens. You'd be surprised. You can create a monarch way station with milkweeds. Um, there's also something called bee lawns now. I think it's the University of Minnesota. They actually have some ideas for adding small, um, shorter statured plants that actually flower and will produce uh, pollen and nectar for the bees. Oh, so your neighbors are also important. You wanna keep on their good side. So you want to have some cues for your neighbors. So you can use borders and paths and mown grass areas to define your garden area. You can use hardscaping such as fencing or um, maybe rocks or other paths. Add in your garden art, a bird bath, a birdhouse, uh, different signs or um, even label your plants. I read one lady, she put, she labeled what her plants were and they got the neighbor's interest. So they started planting things. 
Um, using mulch at the front of your beds and of course weeding because there is no such thing as a no maintenance garden. We have low maintenance, but not, not, not low, but not no. This is just an example of someone who was mowing the edge. Um, it was a habitat I visited in Rochester. They actually had a right of way that some work was being done on and then they were given the opportunity of either putting it into grass to mow and they chose to put it into native plants. So they just mow a path around it. They've got their fence there and then they have passed through the planting that you can, that they can walk through. So that just kind of sets it off as it's not, you know, it's, it's intentional. It's not just weeds. So how do you know if a plant's native when you go to the nursery? Well, um, you wanna know the Latin name. So met, all plants have a common name that we use. So by example here is rough goldenrod, that's the common name. And the uh, species goldenrod is down on the left-hand side. That's what it looks like in the wild. And the Latin name is Solidago rugosa. So that's the genus and the species. Now, if you go into the garden center and you're looking for Solidago rugosa, you're probably gonna find fireworks, which is a cultivar, and that's fine. What you're mostly going to find in most garden centers are cultivars of native plants. But you want to at least have the Latin name so that you have somewhere to start with. So again, with native plants, there's some issue about do we use cultivars? Should we use straight species? Well, cultivars are just a cultivated variety. It was picked for some reason uh, maybe somebody found um, a different bloom style or different bloom color in the wild, and then they propagated it. But when you propagate for mass plantings, everything's genetically identical because they're doing them through asexual propagation. So that's not <clears throat> great for the environment if everybody has the same thing. So generally, we want to go with the straight species, but a nativar is likely to be more valuable to the birds and the bees than a non-native plant. Um, and if you are going to nurseries and things and that's all you can find, that's better than nothing. Now, most of our native ours haven't been assessed for their ecological functionality to see how well the pollen, it you know, measures up to the straight species or whatever. But the Mount Cuba Reese Center is doing some research on this. And um, you can go to their website and actually look to see which ones that they've done and they are identifying which cultivars are attractive to the pollinators. So what I've actually got here in the photo is um, Culver's root. Now Culver's root in the straight species is white, <coughs> excuse me, but they've come out with this beautiful purple flower, which of course I had to have because it's purple. And I have both in my garden. And what I noticed is that the purple blooms longer in the garden and it's just as attractive to the bees and butterflies and maybe a little bit more so, which is what I thought. And I think the Cuba Center actually had the same conclusion when they were doing their research. So if you can plant them side to side and do a little comparison yourself, but um, you know, I liked the purple and I like the white, they're both very beautiful. And again, if you're out shopping, the um, cultivar, the nativar might be the only thing you can find unless you really want to do some hunting. And then another thing with um, knowing which is native. So we have the common name for St. John's wort and there are many species of St. John's wort and some of them are native to the US and some are not. So if you are thinking, oh, I wanna add St. John's wort for my bumblebees, it's a great native shrub. Well, don't go and buy floral berry because that's the one the nurseries are pushing right now because they have these beautiful berries in the fall and you can use them in your flower arrangements, but that plant is actually a hybrid of the European and a Eurasian species. Now the native species of St. John's wort, the seed pods look more like a seed pod and I've got that way over on the other side. So that's just another thing to watch out for is using common names, you might end up with um, a non-native tree or shrub in your yard.
And when you bring in a plant to your garden, you want to know what you're going to feed with that plant. So you want to think of each plant that you add to your yard as food for a bird, bee, butterfly, caterpillar, etc. Uh, this was a, a single stem of goldenrod that I had in my garden. And on it, you can see we've got a moth, we've got some um, beetles, we've got a paper wasp. And then way in the back, there's also another little wasp. So on this one stem, we've got four different insects. And goldenrod, if you remember, that's one of those um, keystone plants. So it's actually very nice to have in the garden in the fall because it does feed a lot of uh, insects for us. So let's go back to some of those goals that we wanted to talk about. You know, do we, what do we want to attract? So this is of course monarch butterflies. So one of the most significant things we can do for, for the monarchs is to plant milkweed host plants. And again, I said, there's a lot of different species of milkweed. This is butterfly weed in the photo here, but you can match up a milkweed to your garden site and um, put it in your garden. I did not want to do that. Okay. I'm having technical difficulties today. And then for the adults, they need a lot of nectar rich flowers. The Xerxes Society has some monarch planting guides based on the region of the country you're in. So you can go on their website. We want to have flowers for the adult butterflies from the summer into fall so that we can have food for the monarchs that are coming up from Mexico in the spring into June, and then as they migrate back down um, through the fall. So it's very important to have those um, nectaring plants for the monarchs to make their migration. Now, if you're interested in birds, you know, when Cornell came out with this number not too long ago, it was unbelievable that in 50 years, we've lost 3 billion birds. How did that happen? Um, but part of it, if you look at the numbers, is I think there's a correlation between the insects that we've lost over the years. People don't realize we have a lot fewer insects around the world as compared to many of these birds feed insects to their young. So if you're feeding caterpillars to your baby birds and there's fewer insects, you're less likely to be able to bring your nest to fruition. So I think there is a good correlation between the loss of native insects as well as um, the loss of birds that we've had. So some of the things we can do, of course, is to plant trees that provide our birds with all these caterpillars. So native caterpillars feed predominantly on native plants. And again, Doug Tallamy has done some research with his group and they found that if you have 70% native trees in your yard or neighborhood, you can successfully fledge baby birds from um, a nest. Now, if each baby bird needs several thousand caterpillars, you don't want just one nest of bird in your nesting in your yard, you want multiple. So we need lots of caterpillars for lots of baby birds. And our non-native plants just typically don't provide um, the caterpillars that we need. And other things we can provide are native plants that provide fruit and seeds and pine cones. And if you have flowers in the summer that you know grow seeds, then you can leave those up in the winter for our birds like our goldfinches or our other seed eating birds. And that gives them more native food to eat from rather than coming to just bird feeders. And we also need um, places where birds can nest whether it's in your Virginia creeper or your um, dogwood, but they do need nesting and places where they can hide from um, predators. And hummingbirds, um, these are like the top 10 plants you can have in your yard for hummingbirds. Trumpet creeper, even though it can be a bit of a beastie if you have it in your yard, it does, the flowers do provide the most nectar for hummingbirds. And then we have things like bee balm and trumpet honeysuckle, cardinal flower. Um, most of the flowers that hummingbirds really like are red or orange in color and have a tubular flower that they can get nectar out of. So bees, how do we attract bees to our yard? Well, this is a queen um, bumblebee that I found in my garden in the fall. She was looking for a place to overwinter. 
So one of the things we want to have with bumblebees and bees are plants for early pollinators. Now dandelions, everybody thinks they're great to have and provide for the bees. But if all you have in your yard are dandelions, you're really not providing your bees with all the food they need. Uh, dandelions don't have all the nutrients and protein that our native bees need. So we want these other plants in the yard for early pollinators like red maple and willows and golden alexanders. So look for some of those early spring flowers to support your bees as they come out of hibernation in the winter. And Heather Home has these great um, posters that they're actually by soils. So this one was for moist soils. So, you know, if you have Culver's root and swamp milkweed, but um, if you look for Heather Home and her pollinator native plants, you can find some great resources on what to plant based on your soil type for bees. And then this is a photo of a little tree I was starting last year. And um, I got excited when I saw <laughs> the leaf being cut up because I'm like, oh, yay, I have a leaf cutter bee. And I think most people would have been like, oh, no, there's something eating my tree. I need to spray it. Well, no, we just planted all this stuff so that they would get eaten by the insects we wanted. So put away the pesticide can, figure out what it is. And I knew it was a leaf cutter bee because they do these half circles, which they use for their nests. And the leaf cutter bee here is up in the corner and you can tell a leaf cutter bee because they collect pollen on their belly. So they have yellow little bellies. So get excited when you see insects in the garden, right? Um, I will post these resources for the folks on Zoom when I send out the link, but if you are wondering how to find out what native plants you should grow, there's a lot of resources now. Um, and you can just put in native plants for your area. And if you specific want, like uh, Audubon does native plant lists for birds. The Pollinator Partnership is a great site. Xerces is a great site. Xerces does a lot of things by ecoregions or um, different states. So you can actually go in and find things that are specific to your area. And where do you go to find native plants? So I've listed some things here. I'm not endorsing anybody, but I wanted to make it easier for folks to find native plants. So those of you on the Zoom, I will also be sending this out to you as a uh, resource um, on a list. But um, Amanda's garden is in Dansville. She does mainly perennials. White Oak Nursery does trees and shrubs. Uh, the Plantsman Nursery down near Ithaca he does both and he grows a lot of his own things. I think he grows everything from seed himself. Uh, CW Native Plant Farm is in Akron. She's small, it's uh, contact her directly and then some others too. And you can also go online and order straight species from Prairie Nursery and Prairie Moon Nursery. And then they're also online, your plants do come smaller but then you don't have to dig as big a hole. You can also start your own plants from seed um, you can buy native plant seed online and start your own. Or as you grow more native plants, you can propagate themselves to share with your friends. And if you do go into nurseries, there is this line of native plants. It's the American Beauties line. So that's what the container looks like. So you can start looking for those in your local nurseries. And now that we've done all this planting, we do want to avoid using pesticides as much as possible. Um, we do need some pests in the garden for our beneficials, like this ladybug that's eating aphids. Um, even organic pesticides can also kill bees or other insects that we want in our garden. So use some integrated pest management. Identify what you are seeing before you go to spray it. I've heard of people who grow milkweed and then want to spray the caterpillars that are eating their milkweed leaves because they don't know it's a monarch butterfly. So don't, don't be that person. <laughs> put, the, put the bug spray down, all right? And consider doing some of these um, certifications for your yard. There's, near, there's the wildlife habitat certification through National Wildlife Federation. Circes has a pollinator habitat. You know, spend the extra money and get the sign and put it up in your garden. And that way your neighbors will know what you're um, aiming to do in your yards. 
So I did want to just give you guys some run through of um, some of the native plants that I've been seeing in other people's yards. This is down at the Plantsman. They've got a little display garden. It was in the spring. So it's May apple. There is a native Solomon seal if you're interested. And then uh, aster below that. And if you have a small yard or you have a balcony, you can also do native plants in containers. This was through the Mount Cuba Center. They had some ideas there. I have had um, coral bells in containers for years. I've gotten the um, native ones and they do quite well in a container. They're winter hardy in the container and they bloom and I have them on my porch. So you, there are native plants that you can do in containers. This is a friend's garden. I mean, she didn't plant it as a native plant garden, but she's used culver root, queen of the prairie, garden flocks and cone flowers, all native plants. Another friend who's a big bird watcher. So she's got a lot of um, plants here that'll go to seed like the black eyed Susan, the cone flower. She also has common milkweed for monarch butterflies. And then the little Coreopsis will also go to seed for her birds. So kind of a native bird feeder here. Um, again, that house in Rochester that used a lot of cone flowers and black eyed Susans. It was just beautiful in June or July. Um, a lot of ferns are also native. So if you have shady spots, you can plant native ferns. It doesn't maybe flower and provide nectar, but it does provide habitat for animals and insects to rest. Excuse me. So if you have them under your trees, this is a great way to create what they call soft landings for our caterpillars. Because once they're done munching on your leaves, they need some place where they can um, make a cocoon or a chrysalis. And lots of times they'll drop down to the ground and some of them will go underground, but they need a place where they're not gonna get stepped on or mowed over. So having something under your trees is a great way to um, foster that. Oh, this is my front yard in summer. So the giant thing by the door, that's ironweed. I've got some um, coneflower, bee balm, some phlox, uh, black-eyed Susan. So this is one of my favorite gardens in the summer because the bees and the butterflies and the hummingbirds are all zipping around through here. And um, it's just a nice sunny spot that these plants are appropriate to. And I have the mown lawn in the front of the garden. <laughs> And another spot that used uh, May apple for their ground cover under their shade trees. And this was well into July. So it was actually hanging on. Sometimes it, it goes dormant in the summer. Uh, garden I visited in Lockport. She, this was specifically described as a butterfly garden. So she used a variety of native plants and non-natives, but her non-natives were specifically um, nectar plants. She also has her warming stone there, as well as a little um, glass vase that she put some pebbles in and she had some water for the insects to use. And then on the other side of her garden, the whole thing was a butterfly garden, but more nectar plants and a mixture again of native and non-native. She's got some Russian sage in there, not native, but she's got bee balm and it looks like some butterfly weed. And I've even seen um, hummingbirds feed at hosta flowers. An idea of planting in drifts, black-eyed Susans with some daisies mixed in. So this is quite a long bed of uh, single or mixed planting. And then I was on the Wild Ones site. Um, wild Ones are promoting a lot of native plants and there are, um, it's an organization that you can join. We don't have a Wild Ones group in Western New York but they had a lot of good pictures. And these were just some great examples, I thought of what people are doing um, in different parts of the country. And this one I liked because it's front yard right to the house, house strip there by the road. And I can just imagine being out in this garden in the summer and it's probably just humming and hummingbirds are flying around and bees are there and you'll see butterflies. It's very colorful. It's very much a cottage garden and um, I like it. This I picked because it's a wet spot, obviously. You can see the water, but then it's also a little marshy here. So they've got the red lobelia, they've got Joe pie weed, they've got bone set, and they, there's actually a leatris, that tall um, thing in the front that actually tolerates wet conditions. 
And this is uh, Chatham Gardens down in North Carolina. This is a, a Chatham Mills, excuse me. So it was created by one of their um, ag agents down there. And it is a demonstration garden that uses 225 species of perennials, trees, shrubs, vines, and grasses with 85% of them native to North Carolina. So there's some photos of it online and it's a really pretty artistically done native planting. And just some more resources. Again, I'll send those out to you, but these are just some great resources that I have found handy, especially if you're um, trying to figure out what to use in your garden. Um, the CNY Wild Ones Native Plant Shopping Guide down at the bottom, if you go to their website, they actually have a listing of native plants and the native plant nurseries that you can get them from. So they have Amanda's on there, they have the plants been. So if you're going to go shopping, that's kind of a handy guide to have. And I apologize for the um, thing across my screen probably the whole time, but the more native plant species we can introduce into our yards, the more native insects and birds will call our yards home. There is a native plant for just about any site. Not every native plant is good for any site. So, you know, figure out which are which, which ones are good for your site. And if there's questions, I will take them now and I'm going to stop my share. And of course that, I, I do apologize. I think probably, I don't know what was going on with my computer. So let me check the chat here. Um, my face is, did I want my, oh, well, whatever. I couldn't see that while I was. All right, so I'm back live and any questions from the live audience? Yes. Could you tell us um, what kind of shrubs or smaller trees, because I don't have much of a space available, mm -hmm. you would recommend to attract? Yeah, actually we could probably come up with a list for you. So what is your garden site? So she's asking what shrubs and small trees to use. So I'll tell you, my favorite small tree is service berry. And it, it gets to be about, 20 feet tall, but it's an early bloomer. Um, you get multiple seasons out of it because it flowers early in the spring. It should have flowered by now and mine has not. It's it's sulking this April. Um, so you get flowers that the bees love and then you'll get berries that you will never see them because the birds will eat them as soon as they appear. Okay. And then in your yard, it turns lovely colors in the fall. So it is a beautiful small tree and I highly recommend service berry. Um, also red bud, if you're looking for something early in the season, bumblebees love red bud. So that's a great small tree. Um, and then as far as shrubs, it depends on your site. So there are, you know, do you have a dry site or a, a damper site? Um, um, it's not clay. It's not clay, okay. So I love St. John's wort now. That is a tough shrub. Okay. Yeah, and the bumblebees adore the flowers in the summer. Okay. Um, and I can never remember this. I think it's sweet spire that I like. Um, I couldn't hear that last time. Sweet Spire? Sweet. Spire, S -P? Yeah, S-P-I-R-E. Sweet Spire. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty tough one too. Um, if you have a wet spot, um, spice bush is good. That's smaller. Um, if you can find the nine bark that doesn't, <laughs> nine bark is actually native, but they've bred it for all the black leaves. And the dark leaves are less attractive to insects, but the bees and the butterflies still like the flowers. Could you say that name one more? Nine bark? Nine, the number nine. Yeah. B-U-D-S? B-A-R-K, bark. Oh, bark, nine bark. Yeah, okay. so if you can find the straight species, um, that would be better. But there's a lot of cultivars of nine bark in the trade right now. Yeah, of different sizes too. Would I need a male female pollinator for the service berry? Um, no, not for the service okay. berry. Yeah, no, or the red bud. Okay. Yeah. 
other questions, guys? Anybody out on the Zoom have a question? No, nobody has questions. You can unmute if you'd like to ask a question. And again, I have a feeling that stupid banner was up the whole time. So I might re record this <laughs> without the banner so everybody can see the actual slides. All right, I don't, I don't see. All right, yeah, I don't see any other questions. Um, again, folks who are on Zoom, I will send out, we'll send out the recording link. And you know what I'm going to do today is I'll just send out the resources so you guys have them. Um, oh, your slides were fine. Okay, they were something was going on with them at the live show. Um, Amanda's native perennial garden. I'm going to give Amanda a plug. She is doing an open house next weekend so if you go to her website she will be having an open house she's in dansville and um a great place to visit i think she's got some display gardens there all right zoom was good well i'm glad that because something was going on here at the live version so thank you all for the comments um and if you have any questions about native plants you can always contact the master gardeners or myself we're happy to answer those for you and um, yeah, happy Earth Day. Go out and buy native plants and plant them. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was very interesting. All right. Thank you, Judy. Okay. Oh, Michael, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Enjoy, <laughs> hopefully, the beautiful weather that's going to be on Sunday, right? Sunday, yeah. 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 I'm looking forward to it. And my native plants should arrive next week because I ordered. Huzzah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop the recording.